going to call this this committee meeting to order. It is uh, the Sioux Falls City Council Fiscal Committee meeting, July 5th, 2016. We do have a committee of two this evening. Thank you, Councilor Starr. Um, one of our members is out ill, as we've uh, been uh, talking about at the 4 o'clock meeting, and the other is dragging out her July 4th vacation. So, you know, that's all right. Um, we did, the fiscal committee met for the first time in, in quite some time uh, last month and, and talked a lot about some of the goals that we have for the city council and so we'll be talking, addressing some of those things going forward here today. But I first, uh, Councilor Starr, if you would help me, we would approve the minutes, the two of us together, if you'd make that motion. I would move to approve the minutes. They and were I would well second done. them. And then uh, we would, all, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Thank you for the protocol that we need to go through. We're going to start with our um, a report from um, Tracy Turbeck, Director of Finance. So Tracy, we're going to talk a little bit about the reserve and um, some final financial update information. We also wanted to talk a little bit about those the idea of um, what's going on with sales tax growth in the community. And I think part of the reason that that we invited you to come to do this for us is is that we're we're relearning that idea that we need to understand our history in order that we don't uh, maybe relive it. And so we're looking to you to talk us through that idea of. Why did a council, uh, more than probably 14, yeah, 14 years ago, why did a council decide that there should be that kind of a level of uh, reserve for our budgeting and, and how do we manage that and, and what does that mean for us as a city now? So I'll let you just go ahead. Thank you, Tracy. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Councilor Erpenbach, for, uh, for having me here today. I, uh, uh, you know, with, with city finances being such a hot topic here lately, it's, uh, the room is quite empty, unfortunately. Um, but we'll carry on nonetheless and, and hopefully uh, keep you folks engaged in, in the conversation and we'll, uh, we'll move on accordingly. Well, today uh, I do have my presentation segmented, segmented into four, four pieces. Um, uh, you did uh, in, invite me over primarily to talk about reserves and uh, kind of the history and the, the policy and so forth. A number of other things do tie into that that have been uh, points of conversation here of late. Uh, so I, I do want to take this opportunity to give uh, give the committee uh, an update. Uh, uh, all this information in the first segment you have uh, you have seen before, but we'll, so I'll go through that fairly fairly quickly, and then we'll move on to the discussion on on reserves and some of the things that uh, impact our reserves, our sales tax revenues, and kind of how we're managing uh, today. So. Um, to start out, the, as I say, the, uh, the first piece of this presentation is a financial update. As of May 31st, uh, all the slides that you'll see uh, in, the, uh, in these next few slides are all part of the monthly uh, financial report that you, you do get from my office. Um, so it's all information, as I say, that you have seen before. Uh, first of all, the unemployment information. Uh, again, that's, that appears in the first uh, first page of your monthly uh, written report. This graphic uh, is duplicated from that. April unemployment, which is the latest uh, uh, employment data we have in the Sioux Falls MSA, the unemployment uh, in April was 2.2%, comparing with 2.6% for the state and 4.7% uh, uh, for, the, for the nation as a whole. So we continue to see very, very low unemployment here locally. Uh, about the time you think it can't go much lower, it does. Building permit values is another economic indicator that we track, and again, that uh, shows up in your monthly report uh, on the very first page again. Uh, so you see this graphic every month. It should look very familiar to you. Through May, uh, the first five months of the year, our building services department has issued just under $353 million of permits. That is uh, running significantly ahead uh, of last year, about 20% uh, year to date through May. Uh, and as you'll recall, I'm sure last year was a record high year in terms of the dollar value of construction permitted. So again, we're seeing a very, very strong year in, in construction here in Sioux Falls and projects that are, are getting underway. Next picture is uh, a rolling 12-month growth rate for our city sales tax. It does exclude audits. Uh, and again, this is another one that is on the very first page of your written financial report that, that goes out to the council. Um, and I will, 
talk uh, uh, more at length uh, in, in a minute or two about sales tax revenue growth, uh, what we uh, see as growth currently, and how we measure that growth. But you can see on this graphic, uh, as of the end of May, our 12-month rolling growth rate is at 4.2%. So what that means is that uh, over the past 12 months, for the 12-month period that ended May 31st, when we compare that to the 12-month period that ended May 31st of 2015, uh, the most recent year, we've seen 4.2% growth. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, how we measure our sales tax growth. But again, I'll cover that uh, a little more in depth in a moment. Entertainment tax dollars, as you, you know, we track this uh, uh, a little bit uh, as much as anything to get a sense of the discretionary spending that's in the local economy. Uh, we saw that peak out uh, uh, last summer at growing at around 10% year over year on a rolling 12-month basis. You see it, uh, it did come down here in 2016, but bounced back to a growth rate of 7%. Again, that's on a year over year basis for a 12 month period of time, 7% growth uh, through May of 2016 when compared to the year ended May of, of 2015. So again, uh, strong discretionary spending in the local economy, uh, not really a, a surprise given all the activity we're seeing uh, locally. The last snapshot, uh, we show a, an overview of the general fund revenues and expenses on the revenue piece. Year to date, uh, the general fund has seen revenues of $62.6 .6 million. That's 41% of what we budgeted for the year. Uh, last year, at this point in time, we were at about 40% of budgeted revenues. Uh, this particular graphic for the revenues you can find in your written report uh, each month on the second page. Uh, second page of that written report. On the expenditure side for the general fund, uh, year to date we have expended $52.9 million for the general fund. That's about 33% of the budgeted expenditure, expenditures. Last year at this point in time, we had expended 38% of our budgeted expenditures. The expense graphic that you see uh, in the presentation, uh, you can find on the third page of your monthly written report. So with that, I'm going to move on to the second segment and dive into the discussion on general fund reserves. The, uh, uh, this segment of the presentation, I want to talk about our policy, talk a little bit about why we have reserves, uh, the reserve, uh, the history of the status of our reserves, uh, how important uh, it is to uh, spend time forecasting what our reserves will be. We try to look out uh, a number of years into the future. Uh, I want to uh, touch base with you and explain a little bit about how reserves, the interplay between our reserves and our budgeting process, and then give you a snapshot of what our current reserve status is. Looking at the policies, the, uh, the current reserve policy adopted by the City Council was actually done in 2007, and it sets policy targets. It's not an absolute uh, strict policy, it is a target. Uh, the what we call reserves is the target is 25% as a percentage of the overall general fund expenditure budget, and that's measured uh, from according to the policy at December 31st of each year. So our goal as we go through each fiscal year is to end the year with reserves in an amount that will equal 25% of our general fund expenditure budget. The, uh, the second part of the policy goals for the general fund is to maintain 11% unrestricted uh, cash. Uh, that's, that's a policy that is measured on a monthly basis, uh, although quite frankly, if, if we're succeeding at meeting our 25% target, we generally uh, don't even come anywhere near that 11% cash target. So that really is, has not been a relevant, uh, a relevant measure of policy or, or performance of the city. Again, the 25%, the uh, which is the primary gist of the, the discussion today, uh, the 25% is not a floor below which the city must never go. Again, it's a target. Um, there can be very good reasons uh, as the years go by why the city may end up below that 25% target. So it should, should not be looked at as a, an absolute floor. And I, I think um, maybe over time that has kind of become the perception that that is, that is a floor and if we go below that 25% level, you know, who knows, the world might come to an end. But that's not the case 
Uh, it really is strictly a, a, a target. And the policy recognizes this and it provides that uh, if the city at the end of the year and end of a calendar year finds itself below that 25% target level, the policy requires the mayor to present a plan to the council as to how we can uh, restore ourselves back to that 25% level. So that's in a nutshell really what the policy requires. One thing uh, I thought I, I guess I would leave you with in terms of the importance of reserves and the, the willingness to use reserves is that if if there's never an intention to ever use those reserves under any circumstances, then there really is no point in having them. And it, you know, if you think about that, uh, I think maybe you'll look, look at that just a little bit differently than kind of what, what the uh, recent, uh, recent comments, recent history has been. So why do we have reserves? In a nutshell, uh, reserves help us, uh, in one hand, uh, deal with the unexpected. There are events or emergencies that occur that require the city uh, to spend money that's not anticipated in our budget. I think the storm in 2013 is, a, is an excellent example of one of those events that's not anticipated in our budget. You don't budget for those kinds of things, uh, nor should you. Um, we also, it also helps us deal with unexpected slowdown in the local economy uh, that might impact our city revenues. So. Uh, we're seeing our sales tax revenues today not growing as fast as we anticipated. So reserves are, are certainly an appropriate, uh, can be an appropriate part of the, uh, the way that we manage that through that process. Uh, that's, that's largely necessary because we really have very, very little control over our general fund revenues. We really, uh, we take what we, can, we get, we, uh, whatever the local economy produces in terms of sales tax revenues, we have very strict limits on what we can generate in terms of revenue from property taxes. So in terms of our general fund budget and the departments that are supported with that, we have virtually no control over our revenue. So it's really about managing the expense side of the budget. Uh, another aspect that can happen uh, from time to time that, uh, that would be considered unexpected, one of those things that we have to respond and adapt to, what might be a change in the revenue stream if there's a legislative impact. Uh, one example I can think of, Congress uh, recently put in place a permanent uh, uh, ban on municipalities or states applying sales tax to internet service. So for years, South Dakota had been uh, grandfathered in and we were collecting city and the state was collecting state sales tax on your monthly service fee that you paid for access to the internet. Well, Congress just recently uh, enacted legislation that uh, repeals that moratorium that we've, we've been under for a number of years. And so I think it's in uh, 2020, it, it's a phased in approach, but by then we will no longer be able to generate sales tax revenues from those sales. So that's a, an example that uh, uh, we will be feeling the effects of in the years to come. Another example might be a spike in fuel prices. If we budget uh, diesel fuel at $2.50 a gallon and by the time the budget year starts it's up to $5 a gallon uh, that would be an appropriate uh, uh, reason to use reserves that uh, one of those unforeseen things that uh, we have to respond and adapt to. Another element uh, as to why we have reserves, it, reserves really do help us to plan and grow for the future. Uh, think about our Fire station number 11 that we opened, we were able to accumulate uh, reserves in excess of our policy target uh, and open a new fire station and pay the significant operational costs of that without impacting any other city services. If we didn't have the reserves to absorb that those first few years, uh, we would have to look at reducing spending somewhere else, impacting other services. Uh, maybe it's a library, maybe it's in parks, uh, might be street maintenance or snow removal, but, some, but something else would have to give if we didn't have the reserve uh, to support that and absorb that in those first few years so we can uh, essentially phase in the impact of opening a new fire station. So it, it very much helps us uh, plan and grow for the future. Taking a look at kind of a historical perspective and I um, in terms of the, the terminology, the heading on this slide says available general fund balance. Uh, that's really a term that for the most part is interchangeable with the term we talk about reserve. So uh, if you see one or the other, it's, it's certainly, uh, as, I, as I go through this, we'll use that interchangeably. 
This graphic uh, shows over the past 10 years the growth trend in our general fund reserves. Quite often we'll show you this information on a percentage basis. Uh, you can see in the, in the white uh, numbers along the bottom of each bar, the percentage is indicated, so that tells you uh, how we measure it up against our policy target of 25%, but the bars really reflect the absolute, the actual dollar amount uh, in that reserve because that percentage, that 25% target moves as the general fund budget moves. So you can see over the last 10 years, we've been uh, trending upward as you would expect if our budget is growing our reserve must grow as well in order to maintain that 25% level. If we are at, for example, if, if at the end of December uh, in any given year we are right at that 25% policy target and the next year our budget increases by $1 million in order to stay at that 25% level, we have to add $250,000 to our reserve. So it's not, uh, it should not be at all unexpected to see the overall trend being up in terms of the amount of dollars that we have in our reserve, as long as we maintain a, a policy of 25%. So you can see that the history uh, are, of those general fund reserves indicates we have been at times significant, significantly above that 25% target level. You can see in 2015, and I mentioned the fire station, but in 2015 we used about two and a half million dollars or so uh, of that reserve, we still ended the year uh, just under 29%, uh, so we were well above our reserve target, uh, but that allowed us to open that new fire station. In addition, some of that uh, reserve that was utilized went toward uh, one time some significant re uh, repair and maintenance projects, remodeling at City Hall, uh, the main fire station. We did a, a project that was uh, tuck pointed, tuck pointed that it was uh, quite a costly project but it's one of those that, that's a, a one-time project and the, utilizing some of those excess reserves is a one-time source of funding. So that's an appropriate uh, reason to spend those reserves down a little bit. In 2016, you can see we are projecting uh, to utilize about $3 million in reserves. That's consistent uh, with what you folks saw when we presented and approved the budget last fall, or last summer and last fall. Uh, we are still absorbing the cost of that fire station, rolling that into the budget uh, in terms of uh, our revenue stream supporting that, that cost. Uh, we're also opening a new aquatic center later this year. That will have uh, operational budget impacts. Uh, this year we're also tackling some additional uh, one-time projects. I think you know that the Cayley uh, Branch Library is seeing a significant remodeling uh, project this year that, that is funded through the general fund. Uh, we have additional one-time projects budgeted for City Hall, some additional uh, kind of the final phase of remodeling City Hall and some City Hall landscaping, as well as the, the workforce, uh, that pilot project or pilot program uh, that I know you're gonna hear a little bit about uh, later. Uh, that's also uh, part of that uh, reduction in our projected reserves for 2016. So last year at this time when the budgets were presented, we projected uh, even though we budgeted to use uh, more, we projected that we would utilize about $3 million of reserves in 2016, and that ultimately would, would end the year then, uh, based on projections a year ago, at 25, a little over 25% reserve level. So we're trying to manage uh, down to that 25% level. We think that's appropriate, um, and appropriate uh, given the policy target. So this presents the history um, of those reserve levels and gives you some of the background of why it's changed. Uh, but I think it's more important as we look ahead to uh, focus on the future. And we do that uh, by forecasting reserves. And, and we, we spend a lot of time uh, as we develop the budget uh, in forecasting what our reserves will be in the future years. You know, the city enjoys a very strong financial position today, we have in the past, but that doesn't happen uh, by accident. It does take a considerable amount of time and energy to forecast those future reserve levels. Uh, that's one mistake I think that many communities make. They don't spend enough time uh, to adequately forecast uh, what the, the impacts of some of their today's decisions will have in their long-term operational costs. And that's one thing I think Sioux Falls uh, historically has done very, very well. So the importance of forecasting reserves 
really can't be overstated. Uh, it does help us to prepare for what's ahead, whether it's opening a new fire station, adding to our police force, operating a new aquatic center or an office building, or whatever the capital project might be that we see out there in the future. It's important that we take those things into account uh, in that forecasting process. And again, it helps us to focus uh, on the long-term impacts of today's decisions. It really, th that forecast that we develop, and you see in a graphic presentation, and you'll see that as we uh, go into the budget process, what we're forecasting uh, in the next month or so for 2017 and beyond, but it establishes the, you know, the confines within which we manage the city, and it really prevents us from making mistakes. It prevents us from overextending the city financially. It prevents us from shirking our responsibilities by putting things off or ignoring uh, some of those future impacts to our operational budget of today's decisions. It uh, prevents us from making unrealistic assumptions, whether it's what things will cost or the revenues to be generated. And it really, in a nutshell, it boils down to it prevents us from living beyond our financial means. And that's really, um, out of all the presentations that you see, all the slides that you see in the budget process, the one that really is absolutely key and essential is that future uh, reserve forecast. And, and so it's something we spend a lot of time developing and it's uh, uh, something maybe we don't spend enough time talking about in the budget process, but it is uh, critically important. So reserves as a uh, part of the budget process, they do play a very important uh, role in the budget development process. And in, the, in its simplest terms, uh, the, the, the budget is really very, very simple. We have uh, the general fund budget needs two things. We need money to support our expenditures, and we have a, a requirement to have some amount of money in reserves at the end of the year. So there's money we want to spend and the money we want to have in our bank account at the end of the year. That money comes from two places. One, it comes from revenues that we're going to generate next year, and it comes from money we already have today in the bank. So that's really the, in its simplest terms, the balanced budget equation. In South Dakota, by law, we have to have a balanced budget, and that means that our financial requirements of expenditures and our desired reserve at the end of the year have to be offset entirely by revenues we're going to collect or money we already have in the bank. So that's, that's what a balanced budget means in the state of South Dakota. And so you can see the reserves play a part on both sides of that equation, the money we have at the beginning of the year and the money we want to have at the end of the year. So let me show you a, a historical table uh, showing the amount of reserves that we have budgeted to use. And that is a, something that is, uh, I don't like to speak in absolutes, but it's something we always do. It's just the way the budget comes together. It's a prudent way to do this. Uh, and, and it really prevents us from accumulating more and more reserves on top of reserves. Uh, but we do budget to use reserves each year. Uh, you can see in 2010, uh, for example, uh, we budgeted to use $5.3 million in reserves. In actuality, by the time the books were closed on 2010, we had added $600,000 to reserves. 2011, the budget reflected we were going to use $4.2 million. At the end of the year, we had actually added 1.9 million. 2012, we budgeted to use 3.9, we added 1.5. 2013, we budgeted to use 3.8, we added $400,000. 2014, again, we budgeted to use 3.8 million, we added $100,000 to the reserve. Last year, 2015, so I, you can kind of see the pattern here. We typically uh, will use far less reserves in, in actual results than what we budget to use. Uh, and that's an important pattern to understand, consistently less than what the budget will reflect. So why is this? A couple of reasons. Revenues are typically budgeted very realistically, but conservatively. Uh, we don't get uh, overly optimistic in terms of our revenue budgets, and generally revenues actual revenues will exceed 
the amount of revenues estimated in the original budget. So that will tend to cause us to use less of our reserve than what was budgeted, as the table indicates. Expenditure budgets cannot be overspent, so we never, ever, ever overspend a budget. That simply does not happen. Uh, so there's always some amount of expenditures that are remain unspent at the end of the year. So if revenues come in more than what's budgeted, expenditures are less, actual expenses are less than what was budgeted to be spent, therefore we will use less reserve than what we anticipated. And in fact, as the table indicates, in, in what, five out of the last six years, we have actually uh, put, more money in the, put more money in the reserve and not used reserves. In 2015, uh, we did use $2.7 million in reserves. As the table says, we planned to use or budgeted uh, to use $5.3 million. That was a projection at the beginning of the year. Uh, that was the budget at the beginning of the year, and based on our projections uh, of revenues potentially coming in over, expenditures under, uh, we expected to use about $3 million, and we ended up using about $2.7 million. So it's a deliberate, conscious decision in 2015 uh, to use a portion of the reserves in excess of that 25% level uh, to end down that way, down close to that 25% amount. Um, again, some of the reasons behind that, opening fire station 11, uh, city hall remodeling, the main fire station uh, tuck pointing are, are really the, the three biggest items that factored into that. So we've got a what I believe is a very solid track record of budgeting uh, conservatively, keeping expenditures within our means, and strategically using those one-time reserve dollars on one-time expenditures. Last slide on, on reserves, uh, just a snapshot of the status of reserves, and it gives you an idea of, of how they can change throughout the year, and that's really the reason we look at this uh, from a policy standpoint at the end of December. Uh, at the end of April, uh, you can see we, looking at the column uh, for April anyway, you can see that we started the year with $43.5 million in our general fund reserves. Based on the revenues and expenditures to date, as, uh, through the end of April, we had utilized $11.3 million, and so we had $32 million in reserves that it's equal about 20% of our general fund budget. Keep in mind that we get our first half property tax payment in May, so you can see in May, revenues have jumped significantly. Uh, we've actually put money back into the, our fund balance, 9.7 million, bringing our reserves at that point to 53.2 million, uh, or 33.5% of our general fund budget. Again, this is a snapshot. It's really intended to demonstrate how, much, how that reserve level fluctuates throughout the year uh, based upon revenue streams. And I, I mentioned property taxes as a key one. And it really reinforces why the policy calls for a 25% uh, target to be measured at at the end of December each year. We are projecting, again, uh, the end of this year to be just slightly above that 25% level by the end of 2016. So I want to talk a little bit about budgeting sales tax revenue. That's on, uh, that's on all of our minds here lately. Um, it's been a, a topic of conversation and some news coverage. Um, so a lot has been said about sales tax revenues recently, and I made me think of uh, some of the things I've read made me think of Mark Twain. I think he was credited with uh, writing something to the effect that uh, the reports of my demise have been greatly exaggerated. Well, the reports of the demise of the city sales tax revenue has also been greatly exaggerated. Uh, there's been a significant uh, misconception, uh, misperception, uh, kind of uh, fermenting out there by some that our sales tax revenues are actually shrinking. Uh, that's simply not the case at least not by any measure that I would rely on, and certainly not on any measure that the city council should rely on. Things are not bleak, and comments like, everything is pretty much down across the board, simply have no basis in reality whatsoever. So in this segment of the presentation, my goals are, are really three. One, to inform and educate the council and the public, to arm you folks with the facts, the facts that are based on reality, and to demonstrate that the sky really is not falling and maybe send Chicken Little back to the hen house for a while. 
So budgeting for sales tax revenues, it is very, very important. It's a key source of revenue for the city. 40% of our general fund revenues are made up of that first penny sales tax. So it's, it's very, very important to us. That revenue source has a long history of revenue growth over the very long term, averaging about 6% growth. And it really is a key to keeping up with the growth that we're seeing in the community, the growth in population, the growth in the demand for services, uh, really across the board. So without the growth in that sales tax revenues, uh, we, would, we would certainly be, be struggling much more than anybody could ever imagine. Uh, I do want to touch on the history, kind of the, the track record of what's been budgeted as sales tax revenues and what we've seen as actual revenue so you can get a feel for uh, how accurate or how predictable this revenue source is. I also want to talk a little bit about challenges, some of the uh, uh, factors that would tend to distort the true revenue trend. If you don't take those into account, if you don't really understand those, it's easily uh, misunderstood uh, if you're comparing the wrong numbers. And then some of the methodologies, are there, and there are a number, uh, ways to measure the growth in sales tax revenues. Some of them are really quite poor methods in my view. So this is the track record. Uh, really compares what was budgeted for sales tax revenues in each of those last six years compared with what the actual revenues were at the end of the year. And those actual revenues are stand up under audit. There's nothing that's uh, moved around to make the numbers look good, uh, anything like that. You can see the uh, uh, walking through, again, through the numbers, 2010. And if you think about what was happening then, we were just coming out of a recession. Budgeted 47.9 million, took in 44.2 million. So that's the, over the last six years, the most significant shortfall that we've seen. Beginning in 2011 then, took a, I, I suppose, largely because of what was happening in the economy at that time. And keep in mind, the budgets are, these estimates are set and the budgets are developed at least six to eight months before the fiscal year ever begins. So there's a lot that happens between the time these numbers are established and, and the time that the fiscal year actually begins. 2011, took a little more conservative approach uh, as it turns out, of course you never know at the time, uh, actually revenues came in $3 million over what was budgeted. 2012, actual revenues exceeded budget by 1.6 million. 2013, we exceeded uh, budget estimates by 1.7. 2014, the excess was 1.6 million. And in 2015, uh, revenues came in about a half a million dollars below what had been budgeted. So over, those, over that six year track record, uh, we've budgeted uh, just under $300 million. Uh, we saw actual revenues of 303.4 million or about 3.6 over, over what had been estimated. That's a variance of 1.2%. I think that's a track record that uh, I'd put up against any any community uh, anywhere in, in terms of their uh, forecasting strategies. To put 2015 a little bit into perspective, that half a million dollars is about just a little less than 1% of what sales tax revenues were budgeted and about three tenths of 1% of our total general fund budget. So this, uh, I believe, demonstrates the sound reliable methodology that we do use to track sales tax growth and project our future revenues. So uh, to those folks who might question what we say, what we do or how we do it as it relates to sales tax revenues really only need to look at this track record. There's certainly nothing willy nilly about how we go about uh, budgeting for these uh, critical revenues for the city. So I want to talk now a little bit about the, how we measure sales tax growth. Uh, there are a lot of different ideas out there. Seems like a simple idea, um, but like many things in city finance, it's not as simple as you might think. Sales taxes, of course, uh, if you go in and buy something today, you pay that sales tax to the vendor. Uh, at the end of the month, the vendor closes his books, and by the 20th of the following month, uh, he's got to file, in, in most cases, 20th, if they file electronically, it's actually the 23rd, uh, but they've got to file a return with the state of South Dakota. So a sales tax you might pay on a purchase today doesn't actually get remitted to the state until August. And we may not see some of that money until September. 
The state actually processes distributions to the city twice a month. So they will have a cutoff partway through the month, process the returns that have come in, and send us a payment sometime uh, in the latter half of the month, typically. Any returns that come in after that cutoff are then processed after the end of the month, and we get the payment associated with that, with those returns early in the next month. So you can see there are some important timing differences that can occur and, and, and skew numbers depending on which numbers you're looking at. Uh, those returns that are filed by thousands of retailers with the state uh, are processed, as I say, in two different batches, and the city gets a portion of that revenue uh, in each of two different calendar months. So those timing issues can and do distort the amount of uh, amount of money received by the city in any one calendar month. And throughout the process, of course, humans are involved. There, it's a human that, that processes the, the books for, the, for each retailer and each vendor. Um, there are humans involved at the state level that process those returns, determine how much money comes to the city, and actually processes that payment to the city. We have humans that process that information uh, on our end, so there are uh, potential timing issues that arise from that alone throughout the process. People get sick, people have vacations. Uh, the state uh, does not necessarily cut off on the same day every month. Those cutoffs will range anywhere from the 15th of the month to the 23rd of the month. So that first cutoff and when, when returns are due right in the middle of that time frame, you can see significant fluctuations and I'll show you a graphic in a minute Tracy, to demonstrate that. I'm sorry. I've got about six minutes left, so I'm going to ask you to kind of speed it up. I'm going to remind, ask workforce folks to be patient with us. We're going to end up moving this, your presentation to either an informational or another committee meeting. So thank you for your patience. Tracy, we want to hear at least the overview, but I've got, I'm down to the wire here for the 7 o'clock meeting. So thank you. So in addition to the timing, timing differences in measuring collections, uh, we also have seasonal variances and audit collections. The State Department, send, Department of Revenue sends out auditors. Uh, those collections come through to us. We don't know what years they relate to. They, the state will go back uh, uh, a number of years to collect those sales taxes. So let me, let me just jump ahead to the graphic. I was, uh, this is if you, if you look at one month of sales tax receipts, the cash the city receives, and compare it to the cash that we receive from the state the same month the prior year, this is the graphic you get. This re represents two and a half uh, years starting January 14 through May of 16. And you can see that uh, some months it's up more than 100%. In fact, in that two and a half year time frame, uh, you know, it's up, what, four different times, three different times it exceeds 100% doubling. Four times it's down 50%. So uh, that might make a, a great news story, but it really provides no valuable information. Uh, you can look at February of 14, sales taxes were down 64% over the prior February, but in April they're up 82%. So you can see looking at information at that granular level really is worthless. It tells you nothing about what our sales taxes are doing, whether they're growing, whether they're going down. You tell me based on that. Look at that same information, not on a one month at a time, but on a year-to-date basis. It's only slightly better. You can see some of the spikes and, and drops uh, are smoothed out because we're looking at uh, more than just one month of information in most cases. So we're looking at January through whatever month is graphed there. But you can see in, in some cases it's down 50% year to date. In other cases it's up 65% year to date. So looking at, at sales tax revenues on a cash receipts basis, even on a year to date basis, really leaves a lot to be desired shows you no, no real trend uh, that's discernible. We show you this information, uh, the, not in a graphic form, but in a uh, data form on an accrual basis. So we take, out, uh, we take out the impacts of audits and we take out some of those timing differences. So it really reflects a, a better trend, a more understandable trend. You can see uh, much more realistically a trend here than you certainly can in the, in the first two methods. This is the one we use. This is a rolling 12-month graphic. Uh, really removes all those things, all those factors that tend to distort the trend. It removes the timing differences. It removes the seasonal variances. 
uh, because we're comparing one full year to another full year, and it uh, certainly strips out the audit collections because we don't include those. So that really gives you a clear uh, filtered picture of what's really happening in our economy uh, in any given 12-month period. So this is a graphic you see in your monthly report. Uh, again, it's the same information we've shown you. It's nothing new. Uh, we've been using this for years. That's why we, it's reliable. In my professional opinion, provides the most honest representation of sales tax growth, and that's really uh, why we utilize it. I do have another uh, segment to my presentation to talk about how we are managing uh, with slower sales tax revenue growth. Uh, bottom line is we, we are seeing sales taxes grow at a slower rate than what was anticipated uh, in the interest of time. I don't know if there's an opportunity to come back and, and talk perhaps at an informational. Uh, there is good information in here I think that the council would be interested in in hearing. But, I think you're uh, right, Director Turbeck. I think that we we really do want to make this presentation complete and, and that it's that it's available to the entire council. And so if you don't mind, I, I'm going to work with staff to either move you to an informational or to um, kind of extend this meeting to another week, uh, possibly next week. We'll kind of see how the other committees are coming together with their scheduling. Um, that being said, I'm going to go ahead and adjourn this meeting. Tracy, I appreciate you going to the extent that you did. I realize that this is a hot topic at this point. And I think the piece that we need to understand, the, the, the key word in the entire presentation is that it continues to be sales tax growth, that it's not growing as quickly as we maybe thought it was, but it continues to grow. And so, Tracy, I'm going to put us on pause, and we'll bring it back to another meeting in the next several days. So I appreciate you being Thank here. Thank you, Counselor. And this meeting's adjourned.